Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's 4.45 in Melbourne. Um, so I think it will be dark and um, I might be able to, I might have to start switching on my lights um, in a minute. So my name is Ariane Utomo and I'm from the School of Geography, Earth and Atmospheric Sciences at the um, University of Melbourne. And it is my pleasure uh, for me to be the moderator of this afternoon session and to be able to engage and participate in, in the 16th IRSA International Conference. So um, uh, I will be assisted uh, by Siska, who's our host this afternoon. And Siska will copy paste the rules for the session in the chat box. Um, so without further ado, what I would like to do first is to introduce uh, the papers and the speakers that will be featured in today's session. So we have four excellent papers today. The first paper is titled Assessing the Impact of School Facilities and Learning Environment on Educational Achievement, Evidence from Indonesia. And that paper will be presented by a team from um, UGM and IRSA, we've got Jessita Wida Ajani, Alexander Michael Cahyadi, and Noah Iku Swadesi. The second paper will be presented by colleagues from Universit Universitas Indonesia. Uh, the title is Gender Wage Gap in Indonesia Does the COVID-19 Pandemic Exacerbate Chasm? And this will be presented by Ivana Markus and Dia Hadi Setionaluri. To follow, uh, colleagues from uh, Coordinating Ministry for Economic Affairs will be presenting their paper on vocational school graduates in manufacturing industry. And today uh, we have Andiga, Andiga Kusumanur Iksan and M. Fahmi Priyatna as um, uh, speakers for, for this particular paper. And last but not least, uh, last but not least, sorry, 45 time for my coffee again. Uh, we have uh, a paper uh, to be presented, I think, by um, Mbak Tri Mulyaningsi from Universitas 11, 11 Maret. Um, and her collaborators are Sarah Dong from the ANU, uh, Riana Miranti from University of Canberra, and Daly also from University of Canberra, and Yunastiti Purwaningsi from Universitas 11 Maret. And this last paper is titled Targeted Scholarship for Higher Education and Academic Performance, uh, uh, Evidence from Indonesia. So without further ado, let's move um, to the first paper. I think you have 20 minutes and uh, for presentation and 16 minutes, it's odd, odd timing, but that's what the committee is telling me to, um, to do to keep time. So 16, 16 minutes for Q&A for each paper um, uh, following the 20 minutes presentation. So do we have the first presenter in the room? Would it be Jessica presenting the yes. paper? Yeah, okay. Uh, it's going to be me and Noah. Thank you very much. Oh, okay, great. Um, one thing that I would recommend uh, the presenters to do is because I was hosting another session earlier this morning and there was some technical glitch so if you have time maybe one of you could could send um but siska a p a p your powerpoint file just in case there's like sharing issues while you screen share okay. um okay okay thank you very much for the recommendation no can you share a screen i'm going to mute myself silahkan So uh, good afternoon, uh, honorable uh, ladies and gentlemen. So before we start, let us introduce ourselves uh, briefly. Uh, my name is Yesita Wida Ajani. I am currently a research assistant and a young lecturer at Universitas Gajah Mada, as well as an incoming graduate student at the Paris School of Economics. Hopefully I can leave soon despite this pandemic. And I'm here today with my colleague, uh, Noah Ikiswadesi from Universitas Gajah Mada. So today we will present our work uh, together with Alexander Michael Chahyadi from the World Bank entitled Assessing the Impact of School Facilities on Educational Achievements, Evidence from Indonesia. Next, please, Noah. So the bigger outline of today's presentation will focus upon the introduction and then the research objective, data and methodology, results and discussion. And lastly, we will also conclude and um, bring to the table our policy implication. 
So from the introduction, we can see that education has long been the forefront of the economic development, and this is due to its nature and in increasing economic efficiency through social capacity. Uh, in different countries, education has proven its role in enhancing the way people process information, as well as learning new different set of skills, including technological skills. This is by a paper written by Hanushek in the year 2007. And if we look into a deeper notion of education and how it impacted economic growth, we can see from several papers, such as the one written by Barro in the year 1991, which concludes the impact of GDP growth per capita of a country that is positively linked to the quality increase of human capital. So given this constant realization of the importance of education and supporting growth, the government of Indonesia have also exerted extensive efforts to support increased educational achievement. Uh, for example, the first one is the 20% budget rule stating the need for compliance for both central as well as the local government in allocating 20% of their budgets to be spent on education. And since 2004, the government has also improved on policies regarding equity as well as prolonged access through Bantuan Operasional Sekolah or BOS, Kartu Indonesia Pintar, PNPM Generasi, and many others to prevent the poor children from dropping out from school. BOS is one of the many programs uh, intended or initiated with the intention of providing direct financial help to the poor students who were selected by schools based on the allocations that they have received. However, despite the extensiveness of uh, efforts of taken by the government, which focus on education in both local and national government, the, the results have been inconclusive and mixed. For example, we can see from the trends in international mathematics and science study or themes, which showed that eight great students in Indonesia were ranked 38 out of 42 countries participating in the assessment. Moreover, if you look at uh, the number of the end result, we can see that only nine provinces in Indonesia managed to obtain higher score than the national average of 51.84, with provinces such as Papua, Aceh, as well as West Sulawesi as the three provinces with the lowest average. Additional to this, a paper by Biti et al. Uh, and Smeru Rice Program in the year 2018 also added that there are still a stark differences between uh, the performance of the poorest quantile children as well as the richest quantile children. As education grade completion rate decreases, the difference in attainment between these income groups have increased significantly uh, through as much as 23 percentage point. Next, please. Therefore, uh, this paper aims to disentangle the effect of school inputs and learning environment on student achievement as depicted by the UJA national score. And we also take one step further to analyze whether regional differences exist upon the impact of school input as well as learning environment on educational achievement. Our initial hypothesis suggests that regions aside from Java and Bali might suffer from a higher effect due to higher percentage of damaged classroom as compared to the other regions. And now for the data and method, it will be presented by my uh, colleague, uh, Noah. Noah, the floor is yours. Hey, thank you, Jessita. Uh, this research uses the 2017 Dapodic data set, and it's combined with the Pustendic data set that provides a nationwide by name and by address information of schools in Indonesia. And after data cleaning, we are left with around 35,000 observations for junior high school and around 11,000 observations for both high school and vocational high school. The cleaning process eliminates errors such as double input and invalid values. For example, we found that the data has uh, observation of schools with zero students in the data set. And we will be estimating a linear model that is written in the matrix form here, where y is the factor of dependent variable. And that is the standardized average exam adjusted for the integrity index. And C is a matrix of continuous variables, S is a matrix of dummy variables, R is a matrix of interaction terms, while beta, gamma, and lambda are factors of parameters. And epsilon is the factor of errors. And we are estimating the linear model using OLS for each school level. And since the dependent variable is standardized, we can directly interpret the beta coefficient as the effect size. And we are using ACOX classification for the effect size. Uh, the use of, of effect size is particularly important for data sets with large observations, as, such as the one we are using, because even the slightest difference can be statistically significant with large enough observations. 
We are using three sets of variables, covering continuous variables, percentage of demo class, teacher with little degree, and our teacher, classes and student teacher ratio. And we also include dummy variables, internet availability, electricity availability, both status, accreditation status, public status, and island location. It is the regional dummy. And we are using schools in Java as the reference level because it has the most amount of school and the highest average exam. And we also include some interaction terms to see whether or not that our result depends on certain variables in the model. And before moving on to the result, we would like to show you the residual diagnosis to ensure that our model produce unbiased estimates that have the smallest variance of all possible linear estimators, that is the blue coefficient. And starting for, from the SMP uh, data for the junior high school, uh, the QQ plot and standardized residual histogram shows that the residual is not exactly normally distributed. And the residual versus predicted value and the response versus predicted plots shows that there is no correlation of the linearity and homoscedasticity assumption. And the index plot shows that there is no pattern in the way the data is ordered, confirming that our data is IID. And the Cook's D plot shows some potential influential observation. However, the absolute value distance are small. And for the high school data, we see that the residual is more normally distributed than the, SM, the junior high school data. And we also see that there is no correlation of the linearity and homoscedasticity assumptions. The index plot also confirms that our data is IID and the Cook's D plot shows some potentially influential observation, especially the one on the left, but their absolute value, their absolute value distance is, remains small. And lastly, for the vocational high school, we see that the residual is not exactly normal again, and there is no correlation of the linearity and homoscedasticity assumptions. And we see that the data is IID. And again, we see that there are some potentially influential observation, but the distance remains small. In summary, the residual diagnosis shows that uh, the distribution are not exactly normal. However, the normality assumption is covered by the central limit theorem. And we see that there is no violation of the linearity and homoscedasticity assumptions. However, we will use a heteroscedasticity robust standard error because due to our large observations, statistical tests will show that the model has a violation of the assumption. And we are also sure that the data is IID and we found that the absolute distance of the potentially influential observation is small. Next for the result, uh, we, we are reporting the results uh, that are at least statistically significant at the 0.1 level, and we also include the effect size for further interpretation. Uh, we found that damage classroom affects student achievement in a negative manner for all level, but the effect size is small. And we find that for junior high school and vocational high school, uh, that the schools with electricity perform better with a strong effect. And junior high school with internet access perform worse with a medium effect, while vocational high school with internet, internet access perform better with a strong effect. And we see that the interaction between internet and electricity show a positive medium effect for junior high school. However, it is reversed for vocational high school that show a strong negative effect. And we also found that percentage of honorary teacher affects student achievement negatively, but the effect is small. And we found that schools that receive both perform worse with a strong effect. However, when including the interaction with the regional dummies, we found that outside of Java and Bali, schools that receive both perform a better, perform better with varying effect size ranging from medium to strong. And we found that high school and vocational high school with A accreditation perform better with medium effect for, for vocational high school and strong effect for high school. And we found that for certain regions, public schools perform worse than private ones with medium effect. And we believe that it might be due to local capacity mismatch and inefficient school budget spending. And with that, I give it back to Jessica. Thank you very much, Noah. So lastly, we will discuss about the conclusion of our paper as well as the predictive policy implication. So firstly, we understand that damage classroom impacts students' achievement in a negative manner, and this is constant for all school levels. 
meaning that given the importance of school facilities on achievement, policies such as the Physical Special Allocation Fund or the ACA, minimum service standard or the MSS and BOS have to increase school access to better school facilities and a more distributed measure of both internet and electricity access. And furthermore, if we look at the descriptive statistics, we can see that the distribution of this internet access is not yet equal between regions. We understand that school in Papua, for example, only has 50% of internet access usage as compared to other regions. And the provision of internet and electricity access, for example, becomes vital in cases as well as uh, era of the pandemic. So based on uh, this is also supported by a data from the World Bank in the year 2020, which also argues that disadvantaged students are the most impacted by the pandemic due to factors such as less access to electricity as well as online learning. Therefore, increasing internet connectivity, especially in rural areas, through equipping every subdistrict to have laptops, internet, as well as electricity, and even offline learning materials that are printed and shared to the students will be ex extremely important. And the second one is regarding local capacity and, and then institutional matching. So in developing countries, we know that reports from Sumeru from the year since the year 2008 have also highlighted the importance of program synchronization between both local and the national government entities, which have to be highly encouraged. One solution to be able to prioritize as well as support the program synchronization uh, can be through correct targeting as well as having updated data of the regions with high percentage of um, damaged classroom as well as other school input deficiency. So gauging from the online evidence, we, it is clear that the management of the ACA funds in the education sector needs a direct improvement where enlarged funds delivered to the regions have to be coupled with a more direct planning to reduce the chances of budget leakage, as well as improve equity and educational access for every regions in Indonesia. And last but not least, because we understand and we also measure uh, the impact of honorary teacher on educational achievement, we can see and also try to discuss the case of non-PMS or honorary teachers uh, and the matter of the school landscape, schooling landscape in Indonesia. So based on the regression, regression perform, we find that the impact of honorarium teacher is negative on educational achievement. This is mainly due to the fact that honorarium teacher are usually hired in response to teacher deficit problem, and therefore they have low, lower credibility to teach as compared to a civil service teacher or PNS teacher. To be able to solve this issue, the government should also hire highest quality candidates to teach uh, whereas selections should include identification of need, selection, and preparing teachers to deliver sufficient yet quality teaching to all students across the regions. Additionally, the distribution of quality teachers in multiple regions remain a challenge. And there are some alternatives towards this uh, problem. For example, the fact that the government can focus on the development of local teaching talent to fill in the inequality of teacher supply in underdeveloped regions in Indonesia. Next, please. So further research uh, suggestion is that, first of all, this research only covers one time period using the DAPODIC data, which does not really provide the dynamics and it cannot really be evaluated. Um, it, it cannot really be uh, in the case of evaluation of a policy. So we prefer to have a more reliable panel data set to, in order to be able to identify causality as well as causation. And secondly, is regarding the uh, categorical variable in the data set, uh, you can add more categorical variables uh, using a panel data, which makes the result more interesting. And lastly, is the fact that we only count as well as estimate the data on average. When it is actually very much possible uh, that the result may differ if we focus upon conditional distributions. Therefore, we encourage further research to be able to include more observations to the analysis, such as as well as expanding the estimations to include a conditional distribution, such as, for example, the quantile regression. So I guess that is all for our presentation. We hope that you enjoy and we are open for questions, suggestions, as well as um, recommendations for further research. Thank you very much. Great. Terima kasih banyak, Jessita and, and Noah. So we have Q&A. So we have an extra five minutes that we could allocate later on. but. How does this work, Mbak Siska? Would you remind me of the timing that we have for the Q&A? If, if you can, that will be nice. So I'm going to open the floor for questions and, um, uh, and comments for Jessita and Noah for their paper. Uh, you could use the raise hand function or you could type your 
question in the chat, which I don't recommend because it's on another screen, so I might miss it. So does anybody have any question? I recommend that you turn on your screen, I mean, your, your camera, if the situation permits. I understand that many of us are working from home and balancing a hundred million things at the same time. Um, anybody would like to ask a question? Um, otherwise, I'll be that. Uh, Ibu dosen kurang ajar yang terus nanya-nanya orang langsung panggil nama. <laughs> eh, ketawa lagi. <laughs> no? Uh, right, well, I have some questions. Is that all right? Yes, sure. Yeah. yeah. So, um, uh, uh, Noah and, and Jessica, that was like a really excellent presentation, although it gives me uh, bad memories of sitting in my econometrics class uh, with Professor Bob Brunick. Um, many moon, moons ago, he used to ask me the question, why is mu not zero and why is oil as blue? I'm like, I don't know, why is it not red? Um, so Noah, thanks so much for those memories. I had to kind of, I, you know, I asked, what was I ID again? I can't remember, it's been years. But then you, 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 wrote, you wrote what I, I ID was um, after you talk about it <laughs> in one of the slides um, after your results. So thank you for that. So my question for the presenters is, what is your definition of damaged classroom or how is it measured in the data set that uh, you use? Was it the dapodic and the puspendic? Yeah, what, what, would, what would classify as a damaged classroom? And do you use... Uh, like some sort of dummy, whether there's a damaged classroom in the school, or do you use some sort of quantifiable measure, some sort of index to kind of differentiate be uh, between one with like, I don't know, minor damage, extensive damage. Yeah, you could talk about that. Okay, uh, so in the Dapodic data set, uh, uh, the Ministry of Education includes uh, some questions to the schools about how many of their uh, how many of their classrooms are, are damaged? Uh, that is including the classroom where students study, also including the labs and the library. And we simply take the, uh, the percentage of the damaged classroom uh, from the total classroom. And, mm, and there is a, actually a classification whether or not the class is uh, minimally damaged or heavily damaged. And we include uh, in our variable that is class that are medium and heavily damaged. We doesn't include, uh, we don't include class that are only slightly damaged in the variable. Additionally, I think Noah, we can also share our appendix. Uh, we also have the descriptive uh, chart for the damaged classroom as well as um, several others, like school facilities proportion, which are divided into three subsectors, which are the internet, and then the Bantuan operational school as well as the electricity. So, uh, this is uh, the school damage by province, and we can see here uh, the presentation, the percentage of damaged classroom across provinces and across regions, in which we divide it into three class, which is SMP, SMA, and SMK. Uh, so, yes, this is a further clarification for the school damage. But most of the school damage indicator that we obtain has been determined uh, prior to our research uh, by the Minister of Education and Culture, uh, for and as well as the Dapotic data. Thank you, Buarian, for the question. Yeah, thank you so much. This is so interesting. And this is where you should collaborate with someone um, using qualitative methods so we could have, you know, clearer depiction of what does a damaged classroom look like, right? What would be classified as a, a medium damage versus heavy versus light damage. What is it, what, you know, and I guess uh, um, that would help us uh, place your findings in context. But yeah, good luck yeah. Um, with, with that. Anyone else would uh, ask a question? How are we going for time, Siska? We've got lots of time, right? I have one question, Mbak Ririn, if that's Oh, enough. yes, silakan, Mbak. Yeah, thank you, uh, Jacinta and Noah, for your study. Um, do you control um, kind of the learning process? As we know that, um, you know, the way the class manage and how the delivery of the materials by the teacher, um, it really um, uh, uh, influence yeah, how the learning outcome of the students. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Butri, for the very wonderful question. So uh, we would actually want to control for this um, heterogeneity between schools, especially between region and provinces. However, sadly, we do not have the data for um, the mechanism of teaching as well as the learning experiences in each schools as well as each regions. Um, and even the data that we obtain is done by through data scra web scrapping and not it is not a panel data so we had difficulties in controlling for a lot of things one of it is also the learning environment as in how the uh, how the teacher teaches uh, every subject we do not have any data regarding that matter but uh, we would like to um extend our research argument as, well as research topic in that case as well as in that sense for further uh, research suggestion thank you very much for your suggestion Noah, do you have anything that you would like to add? I think that's it, Jess. Yeah, usually a teacher certification, um, sometimes uh, it used as a proxy for teaching quality, even though yeah, uh, having a certified teacher may not uh, always correlate uh, with the teaching performance, but you know, uh, if you have the data on teacher certification, uh, you might consider to use as a control. Thank you very much, Butri. We will definitely consider your suggestion into our further research. Yeah, yeah. Thanks so much. Um, thank you very much for 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 the uh, question and for the suggestion, um, Butri. Anyone else before we move on to the next one? What if you have some questions, but um, you know, haven't kind of. Uh, put together how you might articulate these questions for Jessica and Noah. What I encourage you to do is to write down your ideas and your notes. And maybe if we have time at the end of the uh, session, we might um, return to Jessica and Noah's paper. But yeah, really exciting. Um, I feel so old just reading web scrap, scrap scraper. And I used to, I was, I started with Minitab and SPSS many months ago. Uh, I, yeah. Definitely Gen X now. <laughs> Oke, okay, so terima kasih. Ya, kita tepuk tangan buat uh, presentasi yang kece banget dari Jessica Enawa. Thank you so much. So let's move on to the second presenter. Um, we have, sorry. We have Ivana and Ruri from UI uh, presenting the work on gender wage gap in Indonesia. Uh, does COVID-19 exacerbate the chasm. Okay. Um, who's sharing the screen there? Ah, oh, Ruri. Yeah. yeah. Um, Siska, are we timekeeping? Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, thank you, Bu Ririn. And my name is Gia Hadis Yonaluri, and I'm here with uh, my colleague Ivana. So we will present uh, our work, which is actually adapted from Ivana's uh, undergraduate thesis. She just graduated last week on gender wage gap in Indonesia. And we will see whether the COVID-19 has changed uh, the gender wage gap in Indonesia. And uh, bear in mind, this is a work in progress. And the objective of this presentation is to get your feedback on how we, uh, how we can improve our analysis. So a bit of background uh, that, as you may know, that COVID-19 has disproportionately impacting uh, women in all aspects and also in employment. So COVID-19 works uh, not just ex uh, exacerbating the pre-existing gender inequality at home and at work. I think uh, all women or mothers here in the session are experiencing the increasing share of domestic work uh, due to the school closures. And due to that, uh, globally, uh, there's a pattern where women shifting their you know, working uh, responsibilities, sometimes to unconventional hours. And this has been impacting um, uh, women uh, more than men. And a lot of reports and also estimates shows that uh, there is a higher share of women losing their jobs. There is a potentially reduction in the female labor force participation rate, like the uh, what uh, World Economic Forum has uh, projecting. And also in the long run, we will see the uh, extent uh, persistence of the, the gender wage gap that's actually uh, still happening today. Now, in the Indonesia context, uh, there are, you know, uh, COVID-19 
uh, similar to other places in, in the world, uh, it's also creating disproportionate impact uh, for women because women are overrepresented in the hardest hit sectors. They're working in low paid jobs and also having insecure jobs. So increasing their uh, vulnerability of losing their jobs. Plus there's a, there are reports that show that increasing unpaid care work and also the phenomena of double shift due to the school closure and also working from home. And also reports showing that there are uh, substantial numbers of women experiencing a declining income. This also include those who have a small business. However, there is a, a little bit, uh, if I can say anomaly, uh, the female labor force participation rate in Indonesia uh, measured by the National Labor Force Survey on August 2020 showed there's an increasing rate by 1.23%. So after it is stagnated for almost two decades, it has been in a slight increase uh, during the COVID-19, while male participation had a, uh, uh, experiencing a negative uh, growth by minus 0 0.84. But we should look at this increase carefully because although all male and female share of uh, wage workers declined between these two years before and after COVID, there are, all, there are also indications that women are actually taking uh, precarious jobs and this is shown by uh, a slight increase of women working in the casual work and also as of unpaid family workers. And this phenomena, we see this that it's indicating what uh, about the added worker effects argument where uh, as in a short uh, financial hardship hardship seems to push women who were previously out of the labor force to enter the labor market, but as a secondary earners to help uh, the family to survive because their main breadwinners are losing their jobs. And uh, forthcoming reports in the World Bank uh, shows that uh, during the COVID-19, women take up any available jobs to them uh, and it, it is often low quality or low paid jobs. Uh, existing uh, studies uh, around the COVID-19 impact on women's employment are still focusing on the changing women's labor supply during the pandemic and still uh, very few looking at the impact of pandemic during the, uh, sorry, impact of pandemic on gender wage gap. And we're trying to fill the gap uh, using this study, through this study. Uh, just briefly uh, discussing about the pre-COVID literature, uh, as you may know that the gender pay gap has been persistent in Indonesia and uh, studies uh, found that this is associated with uh, women's relatively lower education, shorter workers, uh, work experience compared to men, as well as uh, gender-based occupational segregation. Uh, most studies uh, that look into the gender wage gap uh, in Indonesia use this conventional method called uh, Oaxaca blender or blender Oaxaca decomposition and which is basically decompose uh, the gender wage gap into the uh, observed or endowment of the individuals and also the other things or unexplained gap or unobserved variables which in the economic literature, sometimes it is uh, interpreted as a discrimination and this uh, most of these studies uh, show that uh, this uh, upon me, uh, gender wage gap is largely contributed by uh, discrimination. There are also studies that decompose uh, gender pay gap across income distribution, and it shows uh, the phenomena called sticky floor and glass ceiling phenomenon, where poor women have a higher gender pay gap, and the contribution of what so called the unexplained gap or discrimination seems to be higher compared to women from higher income distribution. So our research questions based on the background, we're trying to look at what, sorry, to what extent that the COVID-19 contributes to the gender wage gap in Indonesia. And are there any differences in the contribution of discrimination or the unexplained gap between 2019 and 2020? 2020? And does the gap persist across income distribution before and during COVID-19? Now I'll over it to Ivana for presenting the result, the method and the result. Please, Ivana. Uh, thank you very much, Ibururi. So uh, the primary data set that we use in this study is the National Labor Force Survey or Sakarnas, August 2019 and 2020 to capture the gender wage gap before and during the COVID-19 uh, in Indonesia. 
The main sample of this analysis is men and women age 15 and older who were employed as paid workers and also self-employed workers. Uh, next, please. Um, our, analyze, our empirical analysis will start uh, with Mincharian earning function as shown in the first equation with Lin wage as the natural logarithm of the monthly wage of a worker. The Mincharian earning function is estimated using the ordinary least square or OLS with variable of interest in this equation is female. Uh, female variable uh, will estimate the degree to which women earn relative to men when other things uh, are held constant. The function will be estimated separately for 2019 and 2020, and we will also compare the results with OLS estimation using the pooled cross-section data as shown in the second equation. And in the pooled OLS, we also include dummy of year and interaction between dummy of year and for formal sector as our variable of interest. And then for further analysis, we also use the Oakaka blender decomposition method to disintegrate the gender wage gap into gaps explained by observed characteristics or workers' endowment and unexplained due to unobserved characteristics and often interpreted as discrimination effect uh, in the labor market. The gender gap is decomposed as shown in the uh, third equation. And then the Oakaka blender decomposition is extended to quantile decomposition using the recentered influence function or RIF as shown in the fourth equation. Next, please. And here is the variables uh, that we use uh, in our study. The main independent variables are female, COVID, and year 20 as the dummy of year. And then the control variables are divided to social demographic characteristics such as age, education, marital status, urban, and job characteristics such as employment sector, work hour, economic sector, work experience, and also uh, the usage of internet uh, for jobs. Next. And here's the result in both years. Uh, women's wage are lower than men's wage, but how, uh, however, in uh, 2020, both women and men's wage are decreased during the pandemic. Across all characteristics, the average of men's wage is higher than women's wage, and the widest gap found in the informal sector. But there's an exception where in construction sector and transportation, storage, and communication sector, women's wage are higher than men's. Uh, it might be due to women's uh, concentration on the type of work uh, related to administration, uh, while men are mostly concentrated on manual type of work that paid lower wage. Um, next please. And then the results of Mincharian earning function shows that considering the social demographic and job characteristics, uh, women workers earn 32.3% uh, lower income in 2019 and 33.6% lower income in uh, 2020. And this indicates that there is an increase in gender wage gap from 2019 to 2020 where the pandemic hit. Next. And from the pooled cross-section earning regression, it also uh, exhibit similar results where the COVID coefficient shows a significantly negative value, indicating workers whose in income impacted by the COVID-19 have lower wages than those who did not in August 2020. The year 20 coefficient also shows a negative and statistically significant value, which indicates that the average earnings of workers in 2020 is 11% lower than in 2019. The interaction variable shows a significant and positive coefficient, which reflects the privilege of working in a formal sector during the pandemic. Workers in formal sector uh, are able to retain their jobs because they can work remotely or working from home utilizing uh, the internet access and digital access. And uh, in 2020, uh, although they also experience a reduction in earnings, but the reduction amount is still lower than the informal workers. And uh, what, there's one interesting uh, contract variable from our OLS estimation, uh, which is uh, internet usage. And the usage is divided into three main usage, such as promotion, communication, and also transaction. 
the usage for transaction has the highest uh, positive impact on workers' wage, and by gender, the usage of internet promotion can increase 20% uh, women uh, workers' wage, uh, holding other variables constant. Uh, next. And then from the decomposition, the decomposition results at the mean from the estimation of full sub characteristics, uh, it shows that the unexplained gap accounts largely for the gender wage gap of 90% in 2019 and nearly 95% in 2020. We found that there is an increase in the share of unexplained gap during the COVID-19 pandemic. And likewise, uh, the decomposition at the mean from the pulled cross-section data also shows that uh, the unexplained gap is the dominant attribute uh, to the gender wage gap. However, the unexplained gap cannot uh, be solely interpreted as discrimination per se, but it can be due to the other factors such as limited employment opportunities, intensified domestic work, and also uh, health disruption during the pandemic. And by formal and informal sector, we found that the gender wage gap is higher in formal sector compared to informal sector. However, the composition of unexplained gap found higher in the formal sector, indicating the higher discrimination effect uh, than informal sector. The higher discrimination effect in the formal sector might be due to a complex uh, recruitment process in the formal sector, where some literature uh, also mentioned that women may experience discrimination since the beginning of the recruitment process. Next. And here are the decomposition uh, across earning distribution for 2019 and 2020 data. The row gender wage gap declines across uh, the quantile of distribution, showing a more prevalent of sticky floor and less glass ceiling phenomena in Indonesia in both years. This finding indicates that uh, women and men's earnings are more equal at the top of earning distribution than those at the lowest quintile of distribution. Despite the convergence of the gender wage gap in the upper uh, quintile of distribution, the gap is largely attributed to discrimination, indicating that discrimination seems to be a stronger determinant of the gender wage gap in the top of distribution. Thanks. And as the discussion and also conclusion, our analysis shows that the gender wage gap continues to exist in Indonesia. The result from our analysis shows a slightly larger row gender wage gap in 2020 compared to uh, 2019. This finding can be interpreted that COVID-19 pandemic has worsened the pay gap between women and men. The product value of uh, locked natural wages for women and men shows that Women whose income had been impacted by COVID-19 had a larger reduction in earnings than men. This finding supports the argument about women as added workers during the crisis. Women who were previously uh, out of the labor force have to work in any available low quality jobs uh, to compensate for the reduced income experienced by the main breadwinners for their family. And the decomposition, uh, the decomposition also shows that the gender wage gap is largely attributed to the unexplained gap. However, interpreting that uh, discrimination is dominant in determining the gender wage gap during COVID-19 solely from this large share of unexplained gap may not be possible. There are exogenous measures that could also affect the earning gaps between men and women, such as loss of jobs, reduced income, health deterioration, and other unprecedented uh, pandemic impacts. Uh, and also, uh, moreover, the pandemic has a huge impact to vulnerable groups, especially the poor. Uh, while at the same time, our RIF quantile uh, estimation also shows a, a largest wage gap uh, found in the bottom of earning distribution. Thanks. Uh, our study has several limitations. Uh, first, our analysis cannot be interpreted as a causal impact of COVID-19. Understanding the impact of crisis on the gender wage gap ideally requires um, analysis using longitudinal data that follows the employment trajectory before, during, and after the crisis. And the use of the National Labor Force 
uh, National Labor Force Survey or Sakarnas also limits us in exploiting many covariates in the analysis and the share of unexplained gaps in our analysis is higher by 20% than Sun's analysis uh, and the different estimation of the unexplained gap between our study and Sun uh, might be due to the data used in the analysis. Uh, that's all for our results. We are very open for any reviews and feedbacks uh, from the audience. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, um, Ivana and Ruri. Well done. Um, there's, there's, there seems to be a theme uh, between the first and second paper, and those are, you know, nostalgic memories um, of my bad adventure with Stata, I really would know. Um, when I was, when I started, um, when I started working on the gender wage gap, um, this was before I got married. So to decompose the gender wage gap using Susana's data, lupa, Susana's apa sakarnas ya? I had to do like several lines, but after I think two years of maternal, maternity leave, some, someone had magically wrote the code, so I just have to write decompose. <laughs> Sorry, that's, 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 one of, um, that's one of the theory of the gender wage gap in that women take career interruption and this has profound um, accumulated impact on their career trajectory. Um, okay, open the floor for discussion. Um, Anybody would like to have a question? Um, oh, Jessica, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bu Arian. So thank you very much, uh, Bu Ruri, also Ivana, for the very wonderful paper. Um, I think uh, I was missing a point. Uh, either it was me missing a point, or uh, did you find any differences between the women working in the urban as well as the rural areas, especially because we know that COVID-19 pandemic affected more of the urban workers as compared to the rural workers. So I was wondering if I missed that point. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's that's a very nice and short and sweet question. So before answering that, maybe I'll collect a, another question from Mbak Tri before uh, Ruri and Ivana can answer. Terima kasih ya. Monggo, Mbak Tri. Yeah, terima kasih, Mbak Ririn. Hello, Mbak Ruri. Uh, thank you. For your presentation, uh, first, uh, my question is uh, some studies about uh, wage, they limit uh, the observation on uh, formal sectors, workers only, uh, just for the sake of uh, the reliability of uh, the income or wage information. I think I've seen in your slide, you also uh, include uh, informal workers. So what is the justification and probably uh, the implications uh, you know uh, due to the uh, uh, some sort of unreliable income or uh, wage information from the informal sector second um, uh, do you also control uh, information such as skills or tasks because as we aware of even though we have the same uh, uh, level of education, for example, male, male and female, but in terms of skill subset, maybe difference. Um, I'm aware that, for example, male, male are very articulate and more capable for a kind of technology information things than women, or maybe that's just my own uh, personal experience. <laughs> uh, uh, so do you also control for, for the skill related information? And second is in terms of tasks, I remember Professor uh, 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 Kunal yeah? Yeah, yesterday, he mentioned about the tasks uh, also may uh, influence uh, wage uh, differential. Thank you, Mbak Ruri and uh, Ivana. Great, so three questions, one on the urban rural um, differential uh, asked by Jessica and from Mbak Tri uh, as to how do you find accounting for, uh, how do you find the data quality for self-employment and whether it's possible to control for skills and tasks when looking at the gender wage gap. Ivana, would you like to answer first? Uh, okay, for the first question, thank you, Jessica, for your question. We actually uh, have an uh, take a look for the difference between uh, gender wage gap in urban and rural area, but I think um, it, it will be a good input for our 
paper and we will uh, make sure to try to research on that in our analysis. And from Ibu Tri, maybe first um, for the control variables about skills and tasks, um, we, we don't incorporate that in our control uh, variables. It's because uh, as we have, uh, as I told before, there's a, a limit uh, to exploit uh, many variables uh, from the sacredness and therefore um, we, we haven't um, taken into account for that variables uh, in our paper. Maybe it will really yeah. All right. Thanks, Ivana. Yes, uh, thank you, um, Mbak Jessita and also Mbak Tri for uh, excellent questions. Uh, yes, we haven't taken into account the urban uh, rural differences for the gender wage gap. Uh, I believe, I mean, I agree with you, this is very important given the different, uh, again, uh, COVID-19 is intersections, yeah, uh, impact. So not just women and men, but women and men in urban rural. So. Uh, point taken. Uh, thank you so much. Um, but three, uh, yes, uh, usually they're focusing on formal workers, but in this case, we're taking uh, all of the workers who have uh, uh, weights, yeah, Ivana, and also uh, those uh, self-employed who are reporting that they have income. So I think Sakarnas collecting uh, information about the income. Uh, for the self-employed. Uh, that's why uh, we are colliding uh, those who are, we, we're not using uh, really uh, the dichotomy between formal and informal workers. In terms of skill, like what Ivana mentioned, I think uh, we both know knows that uh, in Sakarnas, uh, there are quite minimum uh, variables that can be used uh, to measure skills, especially uh, the articulation, but uh, uh, in terms of tasks, I think the occupations uh, uh, should be um, should be apa namanya, um, able to measure yeah, uh, the different uh, type of tasks uh, that will determine the wage. Uh, yeah, I think um, we'll take into account the uh, your feedback, but terima kasih banyak. Thank you, Bulirin. Thanks. Thank you. So next is Noah, but just on that, how many, you know, if you're thinking about accounting for skills by using occupation, what, you know, how detailed would that be? Like, is it like four digit codes or three digit codes or you, yeah, um, I, 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 I think it's, it's very, very difficult, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, two yeah, digits, but, I think the Sakarnas 2020. But yeah. The Sakarnas, yeah, but through that, the Sakarnas has information on occupation. I, I did once. Uh, it's actually quite detailed. Unfortunately, not every worker report uh, mm -hmm. they, their you know, uh, occupation level. So mostly maybe we just rely on kind of maybe five uh, category, whether they are in a managerial level or whether they are in the administrative level, but more more more, uh, you know, uh, detail. I, uh, as far as my uh, exploration, yeah, I couldn't find one. But at least those five category probably it helps us to understand the the level of occupation. Yeah. Terima kasih. Okay, Noah, your question. Fire away. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I would like to ask that given the high unexplained gap, how confident are you with the result? And second question is, what should we do after knowing that such a gap exists? Like, what would you suggest to alleviate the gap? Thank you. Yeah, silakan, silakan. Great question. <laughs> so when we know about the that ninety percent, the gender pay gap was uh, explained by the unexplained. Uh, we refer to the previous literature uh, that conventionally uh, are often interpreting this as a discrimination. So it's like it is, this is like another confirmation that the gender wage gap, again, it's not really affected by the endowment, if I can say it, endowment or human capital of the workers, uh, differences between women and men, but rather than something else out there. But again, because this is looking at 2020, uh, if we are talking about 
discrimination per se, or like workplace discrimination. Uh, maybe we have uh, in our analysis, we're expanding the options by not just looking at discrimination, but other things, um, other things that, uh, you know, coming exogenously coming from the crisis. In terms of maybe policy implication, we haven't have uh, yet uh, any um, formulation for the policy implication at the moment. Thank you. Um, are we running on time, Siska? Can you just, um, I lost track of where we are. According to my timing, we are running on time. Is that correct, Siska? Not beside the nerd, Siska. Okay, all right, good. Um, maybe we'll just, uh, I don't see any, any more questions raised in the chat box, and I also don't see any hands up. So we'll move to the next question. But again, if you guys have some questions, um, you know, think, just think about maybe some comments or ideas, uh, suggestions, questions for uh, both Jessica and Noah's paper as well as Ruri and Ifana. Um, hopefully we have more time at the end of the session to return to those questions. So next, I invite the next presenters. So these, these are uh, Andiga Kusuma Nur Iksan and Fahmi Priyatna from Coordinating Ministry for Economic Affairs. Uh, they will be speaking about vocational school graduates in manufacturing industry. Very interesting paper. I look forward to hearing it. Uh, who will be presenting today? Hello. Uh, do we have Andiga Nur Iksan, Andiga atau Fahmi? Um, maybe I would like Mbak Siska to kind of let me know whether the presenters are here. No? Mm. But Siska, are they in the waiting room somewhere? I can't really see. Let me see my view, gallery view. Uh, okay, uh, I can't really seem to see either Andiga or Fahmi. Um, Maybe we could just skip to the next paper and see whether they're ready. And maybe um, if we have quite a lot of time left, we could go back um, to the panel um, and have like a huge Q&A at the end. Um, would that be okay with you? Um, Batri, do you think you're ready to present your, um, your paper on targeted scholarship for higher education and academic performance uh, evidence from Indonesia? You think yeah, Mbak Riri. that's it? Okay. Okay. Silahkan share papernya. Maybe you could start uh, the timekeeping as well, Mbak Siska. Terima kasih. Okay. Thank you, Mbak Ririn and all the participants. Have you been able to see the slide? Yeah, we could see it clearly now. Okay. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so, Today, I'm going to uh, representing some of my colleagues. Uh, I'm going to present our study titled Targeted Scholarship for Higher Education and Academic Performance Evidence from Indonesia. As mentioned by Mbak Ririn, this is a collaborative work between some um, uh, academician in Indonesia and Australia. And this study is funded by uh, UNS Universitas 11 Maret Research Grant 2019-2020. Uh, this uh, paper is currently under review and we are trying really hard to <laughs> revise the paper and we have to submit before the end of this month. Uh, so this is the outline of uh, our uh, presentation today. So first uh, I will explain about the introduction, the, the background of the study. And this study is about bidik misi uh, as a targeted scholarship that uh, be a focus of our uh, paper. And we 
also want to elaborate about the conceptual framework, how we try to uh, uh, work with this uh, study. And we will discuss about the data, empirical strategy, and provide some results uh, and end it with conclusion and discussion. Uh, so these are the uh, motivation of the study. First, we observe that there is an inequality on access to higher education. The data uh, uh, collected by UNESCO in www.education-inequality.org shows that a large gap in higher education attainment by social status exists in most developing countries. Uh, on the other hand, there is a growing demand for higher education. However, in terms of government support, there is a limited resources of the government funds to uh, the expansions of uh, higher education. Um, uh, in order to also increase the access of higher education, especially for the disadvantaged group, uh, government introduced financial aid. Uh, in the developed countries as well and as well as in the developing countries. Uh, however, there is a limited literature to discuss the impact of such program, particularly on education attainment. So most studies that we uh, uh, review conducted in developed countries and they show that financial aid increases initial enrollment in university by those from less advantaged background. For example, Long 2004, Allen 2005, Ken 2007, Page and Scott Clayton 2016, and Timothy Barty in 2020. Yeah, however, as we mentioned uh, previously, there is a much limited uh, studies on uh, developing countries. So this is the background of Bidikmisi for those who work in the higher education, you may aware of this. So this uh, program is introduced in 2010 for undergraduate students from disadvantaged uh, socioeconomic background. Uh, these are the criteria for the applicants. They must have graduated from senior high school in the entrance year or a year before. They have to age 25 years old or younger, and they have to come from a poor family background with parents combined monthly income below 4 million uh, Indonesian rupiah is about 400 US dollar or household monthly per capita consumption below 7,500,000 7, uh, rupiah or 75 US dollar. Uh, in terms of the selection process, there are two, at least two stages. The first stage is uh, on the Ministry of Education. So applicants uh, from, the high, uh, from the high school students, they apply to the Ministry of Education. Usually this is in the semester five uh, during the high school and after receiving endorsement from, uh, by their high school. So the students should be endorsed by the high, uh, their school to assure that they are coming from a, 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 a poor background. Uh, once the student uh, apply into the ministry, they have to go into the second stage where they have to apply for the university. Either they can go with the invitation scheme or the entrance test. The eligible applicants that accepted at the university, so this is the second stage, uh, after there, uh, there will be a list from the ministry on those who apply for the scholarship and then pass the selection by the ministry. And if the students are also accepted uh, to be uh, uh, accepted in the university, they will be further verified by the university, especially to assure the eligibility criteria, especially in terms of the socioeconomic status. Uh, uh, the ministry also uh, uh, decided the quota for each university. Uh, in terms of the uh, scholarship, we found that the scholarship is quite generous. They cover both the tuition and living allowance for four years. 
So these are the conceptual uh, uh, background for our study. So we think that there are at least two possible channels explaining the role of financial assistance and academic performance during the university. The first is uh, uh, the uh, financial assistance and uh, financial burden. So uh, if the student receives the financial assistance, it might ease their financial burden. So as the previous study by Nora Barlow and Cripps 2006, Starter 2009, Boatman and Long 2016, they found that less work and spend more into study, uh, it will contribute to better academic performance. Um, Stan Brickner uh, 2003 also found that the negative impact of working on academic performance. So if the student have lack of financial support and they have to work uh, and the same time they have also to study, it will have an, a negative impact on the academic performance. Uh, another study by Nora Barlow and Cripps 2006 also so, shows that financial aid recipients have lower finance related stress, so they have more energy for study. So we would like to test this channel by measure the academic performance uh, uh, of the recipient and don, uh, the non-recipients by different socioeconomic groups. Uh, in the second channel is through the motivation ch channel. So we uh, found in the literatures that financial aid recipient, particularly scholarship that reward merits are more motivated. So when they uh, accept it in the university and they also receive the financial aid, it will boost uh, their motivation for study and then it will reflect on the academic performance. In terms of motivation ch uh, channel, other study by 14, uh, Orepolus and Pips in 2015 suggests that um, uh, we can also uh, test uh, the uh, motivation ch channel through the gender uh, uh, through, uh, uh, by uh, estimating the academic performance by gender. They found that uh, female students, they are more motivated, so they have a better academic achievement. Uh, the data is coming from administrative data from one public university in second tier rank. Uh, university is the second tier rank in Indonesia, located in Java Island and enroll about 5,000 new students annually. You might guess which university it is, <laughs> but we won't uh, disclose in this uh, occasion. Uh, we focus on students enroll using taste-based system. So uh, in university uh, in Indonesia, usually they, especially the public university, they have two, um, uh, two uh, uh, a system for uh, enrollment uh, application. First is invitation from the high school scheme. And the second is the taste-based system. So we focus on the taste-based system for the entry year 2012-2013 in order to better control for the college entry test score that may determine both academic and performance in the university. In regard to the invitation scheme, uh, since the assessment is based on the report, the academic report of the student during the high school, we can't really control the variation in terms of the assessment method um, uh, and you know many other factors that might influence how the assessment conducted at school. So we focus more into the uh, uh, test-based uh, system, students that uh, accepted uh, using this system. Uh, these are the data that we collect uh, for this study. First is the college insurance score. So how 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 was the score uh, from their entrance uh, test and year of entry, demographic and socioeconomic characteristics such as gender, age, household income. And then we also collect uh, the information in regard to the name of the high school, the district of the high school. So we receive uh, feedback from the reviewer that we have to, you know, control as much as unobservable factors that possible. So they also keen us to control for, you know, uh, uh, the, the where they uh, uh, study for the high school and how the district uh, uh, information and variation. So then we also include this information. 
We also control for faculty and field of st study in which faculty and which major or department the student is uh, study and the uh, academic outcome. For academic outcome, we rely on in at least two information. First is the cumulative uh, uh, GPA or IPK in Bahasa Indonesia and years of completion. So these are the summary statistics of the students. Uh, we have the data from 2010 until 2013, but we only focus on 2012 and 2013, uh, since we found in the data that uh, they have a slightly different um, test, um, uh, test system. So if you have a look into the test average test score in 2012, 10 and 2011, uh, they use kind of um, zero to a hundred uh, range, while in the 2012 and 2013 they have uh, they use uh, you know a large uh, 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 score right uh, because we observe here is up to 500. So due to that uh, reasons, we focus on uh, into the 2012 and 2013. In terms of the recipient of this scholarship in 2010, in this uh, uh, observed university, there is none of the student accepted uh, under the uh, scholarship. Uh, I think because the 2010 nationally, the program has just introduced, so maybe not every university have an access into this program yet. And in the second year of the introduction, this university uh, received uh, five percent of the student uh, under the uh, test score uh, uh, scheme. Uh, they are uh, they were the recipients of the scholarship. And if we look into the proportions of the poor, so the poor here we define the poor as those whose uh, father's income is smaller than two million rupiah a month and whose mother income is also smaller than two, uh, uh, rupiah, uh, two million rupiah a month. So 95% of the student of the BDIC Nisi are poor, categorized as are poor. But we also see that uh, for those who are not uh, uh, receive the scholarship, 46% uh, also coming from the poor background. So we think that this is a good um, uh, observation for us to have the control and treatment uh, groups because we have both, uh, we have poor student both in, in a both uh, uh, category, the recipient and non-recipient. In 2012, the proportion of BDPC recipient increased into 19% and 97% of them are also poor. Uh, we still have 38% of poor students in the non-recipient in 2012. In 2013, uh, the proportion of uh, BDPC recipient increased into 25% and 94% of them are poor. And in the non-recipients, there, there are 30% of uh, poor uh, students as well. So this is the empirical strategy I highlight into uh, 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 a green highlight. So we first, we measure the effect of pdc scholarship on student academic uh, outcome by comparing the academic performance between poor students who receive scholarship, and this is uh, our treatment group, and similar poor students who do not receive the scholarship. This is as uh, our control group. And then we... Uh, we execute the linear probability regression, LPM, to determine a set of characteristics, uh, explain BDIC-MIC allocation. And third, we employ matching method to balance baseline characteristics so the treatment and control group are comparable. Uh, specifically, we use Corson exact matching to approximate the causal effect of BDIC-MIC on student academic performance. So we divide the observation into strata of baseline variables and only keep strata that have both treated and controlled observation to make sure that matching is exact within each strata of variables. So the joint distribution of baseline characteristics are the same between the treated and control after matching. Yeah, so this is uh, the empirical strategy to assure that we have a comparable 
uh, observation between control and treatment. And finally, we run the OLS regression using match sample on three outcome variables. First is on GPA, second is status, where the student have graduated or not, and third is on the log of month until graduation. And we also control the OLS regression by set uh, of baseline characteristic. So these are some um, uh, findings. Uh, so if we have a look into the graph, the left and the right, it shows the distributions of entrance test score among poor students in two uh, enrollment years, 2012 and 2013. If we have a look here, the distributions of the our match sample in terms of test score is very similar. Yeah, they the 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 figure are overlapping. So uh, it to justify that we have a kind of a match uh, observation between the poor in the recipients and the poor in not recipient group. Uh, for the uh, regression, uh, the LPM1, we found the determinants of PDPC allocation. So for example, a father's income category in the first uh, column, we only uh, control for the income. We saw that the, the lower uh, the father and the mother income, the higher probability for the student to receive the bidik misi. So it uh, consistent with, with the aim of the bidik misi to give opportunity for the poor students to go to university. In terms of test score, it gave a positive and significant. So it shows that if you have better academic achievement, then you also more eligible to get a scholarship. We also control for a district of origin uh, female, uh, male, female, faculty and entry year and high school type and also district characteristic. Um, so this is the um, the matching uh, result. So we uh, I will uh, show you the tables, but this is some descriptions from the tables uh, that the table uh, later on I'll show you that we see that before matching the untreated and treated group have highly different means for almost all baseline characteristic. But after matching, we found that most variable are balanced except for high school group, private madrasa and Muhammadiyah school, which are both small in high school group. Uh, the other two variables that are not balanced are the senior high school enrollment rate and GDP per capita of the district where the student come from. So the difference between the treated in, in the control in the match sample in these two variables, however, is small. So this is the, the table that shows you that uh, before and after the matching. Uh, before the matching, if you have looked into the p-values, it, uh, it's close to zero, meaning uh, before the matching, uh, there are differences among the uh, between the treated and untreated. But after we do a matching, uh, the p-value is close to one, meaning that there is no significant difference uh, between these two groups. We also observe across all the indicators that we have. So this is the main regression, the OLS, uh, uh, that we uh, uh, estimate using the match sample uh, for three indicators of academic performance. If we look into here, the GPA variables, uh, sorry, the GPA indicators, it shows the positive and significant with the coefficient 0.03. So meaning that the GPA of the recipient uh, is 0.03 higher on average than uh, the non-recipient. And then uh, we also see the similar result after controlling for additional school and district characteristic. In terms of uh, status, whether they complete or incomplete, yeah, uh, it's not significant statistically. And in terms of time completion, uh, it shows that uh, even though the coefficient is uh, smaller than the GPA, but it shows that uh, BDMC recipients, they have uh, less uh, years uh, to complete their study. So that's also a good indicator of academic performance. In order to test the channel, the financial burden, burden channel, we do a, a, a regression uh, across uh, father's and mother's income group. So we predict that uh, the BDIC-MISI will be uh, more 
uh, the, the, the contributions of BDIC-MISI will be more significant for those who coming from the least advantage background. And it shows in the, in the tables that for those with the income, uh, the father income less than 500,000, this is the lowest one. The coefficient is much higher. And this is statistically significant is 0 0.08. After we control with the additional high school and district variable, there's still a, a significant and it shows that uh, um, uh, across these three indicators, uh, BDGMC recipient from the uh, the most least advantage group, uh, they perform better yeah, in terms of uh, GPA and also time to complete their study. Uh, and this one, we want to uh, check whether the motivation channel work. Yeah? Uh, we see that um, uh, among female, uh, female, uh, so female uh, has a higher uh, GPA and they also complete faster the time for completion, yeah, compared to their male counterpart. So the BDMC seems like also works through the motivation if we check the difference across gender. And these are the difference across college entrance score. Uh, we see a uh, significant here, but uh, it's less significant in, in this, uh, in other indicator. So these are three conclusions from our study. The first is the initial, initial targeting is effective, that the majority of recipients are from poor background. And second, the course a matching technique show that BDMC contributed to better academic performance, especially using GPA. And finally, BDMC may help the student from the lowest socioeconomic group, uh, the most as the aid lower financial burden and give student more time and energy to focus on their study. So thank you very much for your attention. I will stop sharing. Thank you very much, Mbak Tri. So, wow, fantastic uh, paper by three of you. It was, it's so, it's so, um, it's so wonderful for me to see the three different data sources. You know, from Noah and Jessit, Jessita's paper that are um, uses the Dapodik Puspendik uh, data set gathered through web scra uh, scraping. Yeah, it would be wonderful if all the ministry in Indonesia started uploading their Excel. <laughs> rather than uploading random PDFs online for us to kind of try to convert and use. And Ruri and Ivana who uses Sakarnas and um, Batri and colleagues who has access to this wonderful admin data. Wow, uh, I was I thought you guys are from some Nordic country where we could reliably use the admin data set to look at things like the gender wage gap Ruri, that would be a dream data set to have so okay open the floor for uh questions uh, but before before doing that can i just check with siska we still don't have the presenters from Comenco. is that right siska ah uh, okay all right good so yeah any question from that three uh from from um, from the room, please. I'm gonna start timing myself so I don't go over time. Anybody? Uh, Ruri, silahkan. Thank you, Bu Ririn. Uh, thank you, Mbak Tri. A very interesting uh, presentation and reminds me of my students. I have one confirmation uh, question only. So uh, are you controlling or do you control for um, the endowment of the students? So just to differentiate whether, you know, like the, the performance in SMA, uh, but they have a good score during uh, the high school, or do you think that the college entrance will, uh, score will also represent the same, uh, that endowment of the students? Thank you, Mbak. Can I respond? Uh, yeah, yeah. Wait, uh, I was just like watching you. 
<laughs> yeah, thank you, Mbak Ruri. Yes, um, there are so many unobserved variables that we have to, um, you know, collect uh, the data and, uh, uh, you know, get more more information on that. Yeah, in regard to your question, uh, we actually able to collect the data on uh, student U and uh, Ujian national score, yeah, uh, from their high school. Unfortunately, it seems like um, the system doesn't really um, control the reliability of the information that the student enters. So we found that, for example, some student they just enter seven, and other student they enter seventy three. And <laughs> so we think that the UN information collected by the university is not reliable, since this is not the um, assessment criteria that used by the university in terms of uh, assessing the student whether they accept it or not. So we rely on the UN, uh, sorry, uh, the test score yeah, uh, uh, from the student to then uh, uh, represents uh, their uh, academic or the endowment, uh, so-called endowment uh, of the students. Uh, since we think that the test is um, it, it's the same for all the students, so it's objective, and then um, uh, the test, uh, I I assume that it's harder to. This, this is from my own experience. It's harder to go into the uh, test-based uh, system than to the invitation uh, school system. Yeah. So the, the 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 test itself has been renewed and updated, um, um, and then it's nationally used by uh, almost all the public university in Indonesia. So then hopefully it will reflect the endowment of, of the student. But but I believe so this is not 100% able to uh, reflect their endowment. Yeah, but that's the information uh, we able to collect. Maruri, thank you. Terima kasih um, Mbak Tri and Mbak Ruri. Um, I invite anyone else from the I would say from the floor, but from the virtual room. Uh, do you guys have any question for Mbak Tri specifically? And then I'm going to open questions for all the other three papers. Anyone else? Uh, maybe I could invite uh, colleagues from UI. Hello, Pak Joni. Uh, any question from LPM, Lovina? Sepertinya um, Mbak J. Jessica, ada ya, Mbak Jessica? Oh, yes. Uh, sorry, I missed that little um, hands up. Yes, please go ahead, Jessica. My apology. I was going to uh, use the raise hand, but I ended up using the clap one, so it was my mistake. <laughs> um, so thank you for the very wonderful explanation, Putri. I actually have a very technical question. Uh, it's regarding the linear probability model. So I was wondering why did you do the matching using the LPM instead of the usual function, uh, logistic regression? Because I understand that uh, in, in terms of the relationship between the binary and the continuous variable, sometimes it's a bit, um, it's better to use the logistic regression, but is it the case that in experimental research, um, especially in impact evaluation, LP, uh, LPM and logistic regression function, they util, uh, they yield estimate of the experimental coefficient similarly, or do you have any other arguments of why did you use the LPM instead of other types of logistic regression? Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Ma Jacinta. So the LPM here, we uh, we use this to justify that uh, by focusing on the poor uh, students in both group, uh, it's enough yeah, for us to compare the academic performance resulted from receiving the bidik misi. So the LPM is basically just to um, 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 to justify the chosen of the set of variables that we use to determine whether the student are uh, able to uh, uh, receive the scholarship due to uh, socioeconomic uh, status or something else. So uh, the LPM uh, estimation shows that 33% at least, yeah, uh, the the, uh, the factor is mainly from the parents' uh, socioeconomic status. So by doing LPM, uh, it's enough for us to see the determinant of the uh, bidik misi recipients. But in order to uh, do the quasi-experiment, we do the matching, we use the course uh, uh, 
um, uh, matching technique. Yeah. So this is a bit uh, separated. But before we do the matching, we have to do the LPM uh, estimation first to justify that uh, uh, socioeconomic status is main variables in determining whether the student received the scholarship or not. I hope it's help. <laughs> Thank you very much. It answered my question. Thank you, Bu. Thank you. Sorry, I got confused in a minute because I saw my name appear in the participants list twice and I realized that I'm joining both from Zoom and from Wolfa. So pardon my, pardon my, my gov techness, okay, was English, yeah. my lack of technology, technology proficiency. Okay, any other questions for Ibu Tri uh, from the floor? Um, if not, I'm going to open the question for everybody. Um, okay, kayaknya nggak ada. Uh, anybody would like? Uh, so now I offer the chance for everybody, anyone, to ask questions to any of the presenters today uh, with regards to the papers that they discuss. Um, anyone? Um, very quiet today. What time is it there in Jogja or Jakarta? Nearly three thirty. Coffee time. Okay. Well, I already have like two cups, one coffee and one tea uh, with me. So if not, I actually would like to, I have questions. Um, is that okay if I have asked my question, Siska? Um, uh, so my question is actually for, uh, um, for Matri, but maybe answered also by the other panelists. What does it mean? What does a second tier university mean in the context of Indonesia? And where do you regard yourself to be uh, in terms of all this different ranking and why? And yeah, what makes a second tier versus a first tier university? Um, I think my um, head of university won't be happy yeah, when I categorize <laughs> my university as a second tier university. Um, so this um, categorization is actually coming from uh, our response to, uh, to the reviewer. So the reviewer uh, um, uh, try to or uh, ask uh, us yeah, to limit the, uh, the implication of this study. Uh, as we only cover one university. So they keep asking about the general liability of the finding of this study, whether uh, our study uh, uh, finding uh, persists uh, among uh, other universities in Indonesia. So then we try to uh, limit uh, the implication of the study to the similar uh, universities of uh, our uh, uh, object of, of the university. So uh, the second tier here, uh, probably this is our own kind of um, um, uh, grouping here, yeah? but this grouping is coming from first, this university city is actually under the first cluster based on the Ministry of Education and uh, 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 in the previous we have Menristek now in we are under Ministry of uh, Education. So this is among the first cluster. However, this is not among the top uh, 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 university uh, in, in the international rank. Yeah, so in the international rank, uh, there are some uh, major university in Indonesia that ha perceive have a higher uh, international rank. So this university uh, is not listed under you know the, the top uh, university in the international ranking. So then we categorize uh, this university as the second tier. So even though uh, this university is under first cluster of the national uh, grouping, but in terms of international reputation, yeah, this is not as 
uh, reputable as uh, uh, some of the top university in Indonesia. So hopefully it will limit uh, the implication of the study since we also aware that uh, the, the higher rank of the university, it will influence the input of the student that uh, can get into the university. Um, yeah, the second uh, limitations uh, for our study finding is also that this is a, this university is located in uh, smaller urban areas uh, with a lower living cost. Yeah, so if you live with, uh, if you rely on the bidding Mrs. scholarship, it's still affordable, yeah, if you live in this, in, in this area, but if you go to, you know, like, for example, yeah, university in Jakarta with a very high living cost uh, and the bidding missy allowance for living cost is the same flat no matter you uh, where your university is so um, I think that it's also uh, help us to limit uh, the implication of this study to much much similar university with uh, with the same group and characteristic Mbak Ririn. Uh, thank you so much for that explanation, Batri. So hopefully uh, the reviewer will be happy with your revision and with that acceptance of the paper that will help uh, your university to become not only first class, first year, but also world class yeah, in labor economics, Finger education thank economics. You. Uh, okay, so um, Noah, you have your hands up. Okay, uh, Ministry, I would like to ask that if, is there any difference, such as provincial differences, in the test set that is being used to measure the score variable? Uh, because in our data set, in the post-pandemic data set, uh, there are provincial, provincial differences that we must take into account by standardizing our variable. And I don't know if, the, if such differences also exist in the test score for university entrance. Thank you. Yeah. So thank you, Noah, for your question. That's also something that the reviewer came up. <laughs> uh, I forgot which reviewer. There's so many reviewers. Um, so then what we jangan, do... Jangan, Noah, reviewer. <laughs> Yeah. So what we tried to do, Noah, was that um, uh, most of the student in, 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 in this university, the student is quite homogeneous. They're coming from this uh, surrounding areas. Yeah? Uh, 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 so, but, but there, is, uh, there are some students also coming from different provinces, different islands. But in terms of the proportion, I think 70-75% um, are coming from uh, one area which is the close the close area to this university so we also control that Noah. so we control for a local student and you know non-local student because we think that it will influence the cost of living if you live in your house then the living allowance mostly you can use for ngopi ngopi yeah uh, or hang, hang out with your friends. But if you uh, live here uh, by yourself, then you have to pay for the rental, you have to pay for your own meals. So then uh, the allowance really met you. So we also control whether they live, uh, uh, they're coming from the local. Uh, and so most likely they stay with the parents and their family or they're coming from other, other uh, regions. Uh, we also control for district differences. So the reviewer asks to control for where this, uh, uh, they're coming from. Fortunately, we have the information uh, uh, from uh, the high school where the uh, high school is. So then we can, we kind of combine with Susana's data to, to get the district information uh, such as the GDP uh, per capita and the school numbers and so on and so forth in order to control for uh, variations uh, of uh, where, where they're coming from. Uh, it took probably three, four months for me to, <laughs> to then go back to the data. And then, uh, yeah, unfortunately, fortunately, I work with some very excellent scholars like Sarah. So Sarah helped me a lot with uh, merging the data with the Susanas and doing the matching. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now I'm going to specifically ask whether there's any participants in the room here who is an undergraduate or who just finished um, the bachelor's degree. And I would like to 
ask whether you would be kind enough to give some comments about the presentation today. Maybe question or comments, anybody here um, undergraduate or just finish with their undergrad degree? Hopefully we can claim yeah as an undergraduate Ruri. Unfortunately, we yeah, Ruri. can't. <laughs> then you qualify langsung Batri sama Ruri. Anyone? No? Um, okay, well maybe that means if Ivana, Ivana, Ivana just did. Ivana just submitted the thesis. Yeah. Yeah. So Ivana, I'll, I'll invite. So I'll give the floor to you. Can you give us some comments about what you think about what have you learned from the presentation from Jessita and Noah, and also from Matri's uh, presentation? What have you learned? What are your thoughts, or do you have any um, suggestions how they could improve their paper, or you know? Well, what are your thoughts? Actually, <laughs> their paper are more, I, I can say that their paper are more advanced than mine. <laughs> and uh, actually, they also um, review a very research on a very in, interesting topics. And I feel so honored to be here to be to I can present my paper in this room also with their papers. <laughs> Oh, so what are your plans after this, um, Ifana? Uh, well, maybe I will um, try to submit to journals for my paper. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good. Yeah, I look forward um, to, to citing uh, the work, hopefully. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Thank you. Um, okay, any other uh, comments? Oh, I've got some. Um, I see some colleagues in the room from Smeru. Uh, any anyone from Sumeru would like to give their thoughts uh, or from colleagues from my LPM? I'm just reading out. Uh, thank you so much for those of you who had um, kindly put their affiliation in front of their names. Um, maybe to, would people get upset if I started yelling out their name? Kayaknya iya ya. Terus pada pada left, I'm so sorry. Must be a bad chair. Um, um yeah. Okay. So okay, I'm gonna. <laughs> I'm. I don't want to force people to participate. It's a very difficult time. I understand. Uh, but uh, so going back, let's let's go back to some of the um uh the presenters and the papers that they had presented. Uh, maybe I'm gonna go turn to Jessita. Jessita, do you have any specific, uh, I mean, you asked one question to Ruri and, Je and Ivana about the urban rural, um, um, you know, controlling for urban rural location of the, um, of the workers in the Sakarnas data set. If you get, what else do you, what are your, uh, do you have any other comments from that paper? I mean, what are your, I mean, I guess it's, it's quite, I mean, thinking about COVID-19, right? Uh, initially in 2020, we thought that's it. We're just gonna work with 2019, 2020, and that's it, 2021 will be like the post-COVID world, but that hasn't been the case. Um, what are, what are, if you were to review the paper by Ruri and Ivana, what would be some of your comments? Hey, thank you very much. Habis itu langsung di band jadi reviewer sama Ruri. Oh, I'm not equipped uh, to be able to answer. Uh, but maybe um, based on uh, what I've experienced uh, previously, because before working at UGM, I was at the pre-employment card program, Kartu Prakerja, uh, under Kemenko. And um, during my time at Prakerja, I also uh, were actively involved in creating questionnaire as well as uh, research regarding the impact of COVID. That's why I ask regarding the discrepancies of the gender gap uh, between the rural and the urban areas, because I noticed that actually COVID-19 has impacted many of the urban workers as compared to the rural workers, especially uh, because of the uh, one of the proxy that could be used it would be the number of the COVID cases. And then second important one is that you can maybe utilize in the next future, uh, future research is if you can actually break down into the details, the subsector uh, of the work that is actually impacted the most by COVID, and then you break down by the genders of the subsector, that would be very interesting. I think you mentioned 
as well, right, Ivana, regarding uh, that women actually work in, and they just uh, were um, in set sectors that are just filling the gap uh, as compared to men who are working in several types of sectors. So if you can expand uh, that analysis as well as if it can be translated into several policy implication, uh, that would be great. Also, if you want to use the pre-employment card data that I think is also uh, can be accessed because it was involved in the Sakr uh, last, Sakrana's question, last year's Sakrana's question in 2019 and 2020 and yeah, pre and post COVID. Uh, that can also be um, interesting. Thank you. I think that's all for my comment for Fanas and Bururi's paper. Sure. Thank you, Jessita. No, oh, I'll see Jessita. Thank you. So, Jessita, Jessita, I have a question. So, you know, you mentioned card to prakerja, right? Is that that's the employment card? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They 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 did some sort of survey, don't they? Like as part yes. of the. Yeah, so is that data available for us to use freely or do we have to pay? Mm, I'm not sure regarding, I think uh, they had to put some of the questions that they made to Sakarnas uh, in between the year 2019 and 2020 to measure the impact, pre-post impact of the pre-employment card during the COVID era. But I'm not sure if the data is publicly available because uh, before the last questionnaire was out, uh, I moved to UGM, so <laughs> I didn't get yeah. a chance to see the further implementation of the data. Yeah, no worries. Thanks. Yeah, that's not that's not an issue because now I know Noah Ikiswa Desi who could web scrape any data I need. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, okay, um, who else hasn't got the floor? Yeah, so Noah, Noah, I, I just got a... Um, I just got a message from Jessica that you 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 just have recently submitted your bachelor's thesis. Is that right? Is that is that right? No, I just finished. I don't know what that. No, is no, that... no. I I was in the same batch as Jessica, and we graduated last last year. Ah, you graduated yeah. from your uh, undergraduate degree, my bachelor degree. Wow. Okay, well, well done. Uh, that's 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 really great. So, um, any um anyone else would like to I don't know open their camera and just have a random random chat about uh, anything related or not related to research and uh, labor market yeah. education. Yeah, siapa yang bicara ya? Ah, saya Anna. Hello, Mbak Anna. Hi. Yeah, I have a question. Um, yeah, so for Ibu um, from UNS, I, I yeah, Butri. Butri, huh? okay, Butri, sorry. Yeah, so I, I was wondering, um, why did you just choose one university? I mean, if you have the data, I think it would be more interesting if you can explore or exploit more provinces or universe, uh, yeah, universities in, in more maybe in other yeah other provinces and even other um, islands i'm sorry if, if it's already discussed because i was just uh, realized that i mean why if you have the data i mean it's very will be very more in i mean yeah useful or maybe more interesting yeah because i'm also interested in this uh, economics of education thank you thank you very much yeah thank you mbak anna uh yeah, that's also our dream to include more and more universities. So we started with one university uh, because we have the access to the data. Uh, from our experience to collect the data, you have to be like uh, orang dalam, <laughs> inside person. So then you have more access because from my own experience, I have to go uh, and then, you know, secure all the administrative and bureaucratic and I have to use all my tools to contact uh, those who have access to the data. So started from my, you know, like uh, university that I know then I have more access to the data. Uh, that's also the limitations of our study. It will be nice if we have 
have uh, observation from other university. So anyone here, <laughs> uh, I would like to send an invitation. Yeah, if you also keen to collaborate with us and then you know getting an access from your university data, it will be awesome because that's also our plan. We started from one university because you know from only from one university we need like. And a year, yeah, at least, yeah, to you know, collect the data, clean the data, and then in the one university itself, the data coming from different sources. So, for example, the test score data is coming from SPMB uh, office, and then if you want to go to the academic performance, you have to go to uh, bagian akademik. Uh, so then you have to go to the different person, and then if you want to check uh, their other scholarship information, you have to go to bagian kemahasiswaan. So they are a different different uh, section in the university. Uh, so then you have to also go to the faculty if the information is in the faculty level. So uh, it's, quite, it's, uh, it's quite demanding, uh, but we able to complete for one university. So if any of you are interested to join us, uh, we can apply for uh, the third year of the funding in my university. Um, and then yeah, having an insider people to uh, gain the access to the data it's very important in my opinion to to then expand this study um, other our, our other dream also include the um, um, uh, tracer data so for example after finishing how uh, you know how much time they need to wait for the first job and how much their salary and then how the performance during the uh, uh, the time they have been accepted in the uh, in the place they uh, they work. So that's also something that we keen to to see because the good academic performance sometimes it doesn't translate into you know uh, performance in the lab labor market. So uh, our aim is actually looking into the labor market performance. But since uh, we haven't have an access to the data yet, so we then uh, focus to the academic performance. Ya, terima kasih, Mbak. Uh, yeah. Apa tadi yang dari ITB? Ana. Mbak Ana. Ana. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, yeah. uh, Bu Tri. Because uh, actually, it's, you, since you mentioned, yeah, I was going to uh, say that it's very interesting invitation as I'm also um, keen to do this uh, tracer study that you mentioned. So I think I hopefully in ITB it's going to be um, yeah, like much easier because they they support us. Uh, they say that if, if we need the data, they will provide it. Uh, uh, yeah, not only from my uh, my faculty or my school, but also from from all uh, ITB's faculties and schools. Okay, so okay, Mbak Anna, maybe we can, yeah, uh, we can join <laughs> exchange. Yeah, our email address. Yeah, thank you, <laughs> thank you Mbak Anna. Yeah, thank you. Great, thank you so much. Uh, good to see, you know, sparks of potential collaboration happening in the room. So we have, um, is it 6.45? So I'm going to close the uh, session very shortly. But before we do that, I would like to acknowledge that this is an extremely difficult time for all of you to be joining us here today. So extremely thankful. Um, one question for all the presenters, for Noah, Jessita, Three and Ivana. Uh, the question is, what keeps you going so that you could actually present this paper today, given that the past months has been very, very difficult? I'm going to start with Noah, just because you're first on my screen. Uh, actually, what uh, what gave me the motivation to to present our paper is uh, simply because we enjoy. Uh, doing research, uh, me and Jita, me and Jessica, we share the common, uh, we share a common hobby. I think we can call it a hobby to, to do applied research because it is fun just to know what other people hasn't discovered, and we feel that it is very much enjoyable to be like uh, the very first person who knows what is actually happening with this data instead of just uh, looking at this. Uh, busy data set that we have and it's very rewarding that we can extract some insights from data that 
appears to be just numbers in a in a large spreadsheet and it is very rewarding for me to do that fantastic thank you so much noah i really look forward for your paper hopefully it'll get published soon yeah thank you okay uh, next on my screen i'm just going uh, by the order of my um the, how people appear on my screen i have actually jessita what keeps what have kept you going jessita Thank you very much, uh, Bu Arian, for the very wonderful question. So actually, upon graduation last year from UGM, uh, we have prepared, uh, me and my colleague, we have prepared several papers to be presented uh, in IRSA, but it has been a long dream of mine ever since I was an undergraduate to be able to present my paper at IRSA. So after uh, several offers, and we worked for a year and more to be able to present and also to gather the insights from our paper, uh, that is true that what Noah has said is really is true. I would like to write as much as I can be more productive in writing just because I do like to write. I like I like doing research. Uh, at this point, I'm pretty sure that my way and my future uh, uh, is in the academic world. Maybe UGM, maybe somewhere else, but hopefully UGM. <laughs> uh, so yes, um, it has been a pleasure of mine to do research. I think this would be a, ben a very beneficial um, event for us to join. And I would like to discover more about my research interests. Like, is it only education? Is it only uh, development economics? Or should I also expand to other uh, horizons of institutional economics, maybe or political economics? So I think doing research makes me understand more about myself. So that's why I like to do research. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next I have Ruri on my screen. What, do you, what have kept you going, Ruri? It's been exceptionally difficult months, if not the whole year, I guess, for um, for us. Well, what keeps me going is uh, Ifana, actually. Ifana has been very motivated. She has been, uh, uh, I supervise her. Actually, there are three of uh, students in her group and I encourage them to uh, submit, but only Ifana uh, submitted. Uh, so yeah, I think what keeps me going are my students and also coffee. I need coffee now. <laughs> that's great, Ruri, that's good to hear. How about you, Ifana? You don't have to say that Bururi is the one who keeps you going. We don't, we don't, we, we know that already. So apart from Bururi. Well, well, first, because this is my undergraduate thesis, so I need to keep working on this in order to, <laughs> to graduate. <laughs> and also, Bururi encouraged me to join IRSA. So this is my very first conference. <laughs> and I have a lot of free time, too, because I only uh, responsible for my thesis in my final year. And I pretty enjoy doing research, especially for gender issues. So I think that what makes me keep going during this pandemic. Uh, good to hear. <laughs> Bururi students are my students. <laughs> yeah, Ruri, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Ifana, and, and well done on, on, on completing uh, the paper and the thesis as well. So Mbatri, last but not least, what keeps you going? Yeah, it's very hard actually, Mbak. Ririn, yeah, especially the situation. We thought that it will be six months and then one year and then one and a half year. Um, pretty much concerned with this, uh, the children who stay at home for school. Um, I think this is very challenging for my 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 daughter now is in SMP yeah? and she is enrolled in SMP degree. <laughs> uh, uh, previously, we think that enroll her in the SMP degree, then she has more um, uh, access to uh, friends from different background. But then due to the pandemic, SMP degree facilities in terms of IT, uh, it's much uh, less than the private school has. So it's be, being one of our concern. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, we able to kind of, you know, assist her at least at home. Uh, regarding to this research, um, yeah, we have to accomplish because this is 
funded by university anyway, so we have to pay back in terms of publication. <laughs> so this is uh, something that keeps me going because every six months, the university, Monev, and kept asking, when are you going to publish, when the paper will be published. So, um, you know, uh, it's a uh, encouragement or pressure, yeah, <laughs> pressure. Uh, lastly, I think I'm very privileged to be involved in this research with uh, bright uh, and very supportive colleague uh, Sarah, uh, Mira and Anne and also my colleague from UNS so they keep me going to then improve the quality of the paper and also Mbak Ririn uh, you one of my inspiration <laughs> terima kasih Thank you so much. So time is up. Uh, it's been so good to be able to moderate the session today. Um, what I would like to do is for you to say thank you also to Mbak Siska, who's the host um, today from UGM. Terima kasih Mbak Siska, such a wonderful work. Thank you so much. Yeah, terima kasih. Okay, so I look forward to see you maybe in, is it is it the closing ceremony next? Is it the closing session? Do you guys know is that is that at six fifty or six? Sorry, I mean it is berapa? at five. Uh, it's at four forty five. Uh, it's from the KSE section. Uh, KSE session, and then go to the closing ceremony. Okay, well, so I might see your name there. So thank you, everybody. Stay safe, take care, and I hope to see you in person soon.